Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 52 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week, I'm celebrating my first full year of podcasts. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Welcome back to another weekly podcast, and today I'm celebrating my podcast's first birthday. 52 podcasts recorded and published. I'm really pleased to have made it this far. I've covered quite a lot of varied beekeeping topics over the past year, and also attempted a few interviews, which, to be honest, have been a little nerve-wracking. I'm not a journalist or professional presenter, just a beekeeper looking to share my knowledge and views with other interested listeners. Hopefully, I'll be able to try out a few more interviews in the coming year and maybe get a little bit more relaxed with them. You may be aware that I'm sending out a fortnightly beekeeping newsletter at the moment with the same name as the podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. It's early days at the moment and I'm trying to keep it light and image rich, so no massive pages of text to have to trawl through, just a few interesting pictures with hopefully some useful links. I'll be promoting various events and offers through the newsletter too. So do sign up. It's quick and easy. Just go to my website and leave your details when the sign up pop up appears. I'll leave a link to the website in the show notes as usual. Talking of events, we're fast approaching the spring sales events here in the UK. The first major event, which happens on Saturday the 9th of March, is called Bee Trade X. It's billed by them as the biggest beekeeping show in 2019. And it's a one-day trade show with various lectures and talks being given and is held at the Agricultural Showgrounds at Stoneley Park in Warwickshire. It's also a chance to pick up a bargain or two from one of the beekeeping equipment manufacturers or suppliers, as they usually have plenty of discounts available on the day. One of the nicest things about Bee Trade X, however, is that it gives me a chance to catch up with friends within the industry and also to chat to fellow beekeepers who I wouldn't normally have a chance to get together with. So if you're going along to Bee Trade X this year, please do stop me and say hello, have a chat. I'll pop the Bee Trade X website link in the show notes as well. So with the temperatures on the rise just recently, the bees have certainly been getting out and about. I saw plenty of bees flying today, for instance, the temperatures up to around 11 degrees. Lots of the clusters within those hives have been breaking open. Not that we've had many very cold days, but the nights have still been quite chilly, falling to below zero in some instances, and that will push the colony back into a cluster. But for the most part, the bees have started to break open. They've been out on cleansing flights and that type of thing. And I was out putting some fondant on some colonies a few days ago and was happy to see so many colonies with large numbers of bees still. I would say an average of six or seven seams of bees, but somewhere around nine seams of bees, which is really excellent. Certainly, I can't remember having quite so many colonies at that stage. So hopefully we've done things right late last summer into the autumn and through this winter. Now that can obviously lead to a food shortage if you've got so many bees in a colony and the colony is getting more active in this warmer weather but it fails to find any early food source you you could run into trouble. We've had lots of snowdrops in flower locally and now the crocuses are exploding into flower as well particularly with this mild stint of weather. A vital source of food and we're very lucky to have so many crocus plants flowering near our apiaries here and around the city. It seems to be the number one spring flowering plant of choice for our Norwich City Council who appeared to have planted millions of bulbs over the last few years all around our fine city. That said it is still February and the weather can as easily turn cold and wintry again so let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. I spoke to a beekeeper a couple of days ago who said if the weather stays warm, he was going out to inspect all of his bees this weekend. I think this is a little too soon. I certainly wouldn't be going out to inspect all of my colonies, although there are a couple that I'm keeping a close eye on. The first 
is the nucleus colony I have in my allotment apiary. That's the one with the chronic bee paralysis virus. And you may have followed some of the saga that I've been putting on video and in the podcast with those. I popped some fondant on them last week. They're still alive. I, I would say alive and well, but although they're alive, they don't seem to be shaking off the CBPV. I did notice that the entrance of the nuke was badly clogged up with dead bees and had to clear quite a, a mound of those away. So I think they're still suffering quite badly. I'd like to get into them as early as possible, really, and see what's going on. So I, I might have a quick look if the weather holds and this warm weather stays stable for a few days. The other colony is at one of my out apiaries. I was treating with the oxalic acid trickle method a while back and as I finished treating this particular hive and was putting the roof back on I noticed a larger than normal bee which flew across my eye line. The more experienced beekeepers out there will know exactly what I mean by that. You're carrying out an inspection and something that's not quite normal catches your eye. Something that you don't see, but somehow you know it's not the normal thing that you would see around your colony. So you take a look. And that's exactly what I did. So I stood there for a couple of minutes and just watched to see what was going on. And there it was again, a much larger bee than all the other workers. It was in fact a drone. A drone in early February, I thought. What on earth is going on here? Are the bees confused by all this warmer weather we have and starting to get ready for swarming? Well, it's possible, I guess, but I seem to think that it's probably unlikely. Is it possible that drones have been hiding in the hive all winter? It's not been terribly cold, so I think it's possible, but again, I think it's unlikely, though. The most likely reason that I can see is that the queen in the colony has recently become a drone-laying queen. It's a problem that occurs fairly regularly, certainly more regularly in, in recent times. Drone-laying queens can occur at any time of the season, but become very pronounced during late winter as the older worker bees die off, only to be replaced with the drones rather than young workers. As a reminder for all of you beginners, workers are created when the queen fertilises an egg at the point of laying it in a cell. Drones are created with an unfertilised egg. So what could be happening here? Well, as I said, it could be that the colony has got the idea that it wants to swarm really early in the season and it's producing drones really early to be ready. I don't think this is the case, though. We're still in late winter and both day length and overnight temperatures are still short and cold. So if the colony isn't making a choice to produce drones, what else could be causing it? Well, if the queen in this colony is several years old, it could be that she's arrived at that point where she's used up all of the stored sperm that she had retained from the time when she flew out of the colony as a virgin queen to mate all that time ago. Eventually, if left to their own devices, honeybee queens will naturally run out of sperm and the time it takes for this to happen really depends on how successfully she mated in the first place. But this colony has a relatively new queen no more than two seasons old, and probably only 18 months old. So what else might have caused her to start laying drones? Well, maybe she was not so successful during her mating flight and only managed to mate with a couple of drones before heading back to the hive. This would mean that she would have a limited supply of sperm to be able to use and could well have run out of sperm far sooner than otherwise we might have thought. Certainly, far sooner than a more successfully mated queen. Another possibility might be that she has something wrong internally. Maybe the tube running from the spermatheca, that's the organ that holds all of the sperm for the lifetime of the queen, maybe that tube has become damaged or become blocked. Maybe it's developed an issue that prevents her from using the sperm. There's really only one way to find out, and that's to open up the colony and see what's going on inside. So what do I think has happened? Well, I'd have to firstly say I'm not a betting man, so it's going to be a total guess. However, I don't think that they've started producing drones for mating or swarming purposes. It just seems far too early still. So it's probably another issue. That's my guess. That said, I have seen swarms in the first week of April, and if you recall that drones take around 24 days to emerge from their cell, and then another couple of weeks to become sexually mature, 
that could total around five weeks. And if we jump forward five weeks, then we're quite close to the start of April. This means that if we're looking at really early swarming in late March or early April, we could see unfertilized eggs being laid now and over the next couple of weeks in order for them to mature as early as possible. So hang on a second, if I inspect this weekend, I may well see drone cells. So I'd better not jump to the wrong conclusions then. My plan is to take some time on Saturday, around lunchtime, to open up this one particular hive and see what's going on. I'll probably record a video for the Patreon site, so do take a look at it if you'd like to see what's going on. While I'm talking about drones, don't forget you can use Drone Brood to trap Varroa as part of your integrated pest management controls. I was reminded about this by one of our supporters on Patreon, Peter Evans. Peter asked me if I'd discussed using Drone Foundation as part of a Varroa control setup. Well, thanks for prompting me, Peter, and the easy answer, Peter, is yes. I use Drone Brood on a regular basis through the season to trap Varroa. So let me explain for everyone why and how I do it. Most beekeepers are happy with the knowledge that workers take around 21 days to emerge from the point of the queen laying an egg, and drones take around 24 days. So we have a differential of about three days more for the drones than workers. This gives the varroa mite a little longer for their reproductive cycle if they find their way into a drone cell rather than a worker cell. During the spring and early summer, a colony produces drones predominantly for reproductive purposes, and these drones are produced in specific larger cells designed for the larger male honeybee. This makes them pretty easy to spot for the beekeeper as they tend to be produced in clusters within a frame mostly towards the bottom and corners of the frame. It's not always the case, but that tends to be where they are generally. It's then a simple case of cutting out the drone cells and destroying them. I usually freeze them and then feed them to my chickens. I don't want to waste anything as a beekeeper. But with so many colonies now, cutting out patches of drone brood from several frames in a colony takes a lot of time, and of course there are easier ways. Over the years I've tried various methods, and all are useful and generally work quite well. One of the simplest methods is to put a super frame into the brood box and let the bees go to work on that. What generally tends to happen is they fill the super frame with honey and then build drone brood from the bottom of the frame to match the brood frames that are lined up alongside them. Once the brood has been capped, it's a simple job to remove the frame and cut off the comb along the bottom of the frame and dispose of it. One thing I did notice with this method is that the bees also had a tendency to allow the queen to lay eggs in the super frame, which would normally contain worker cells. It's not a problem, but it does mean that I wouldn't then reuse that frame in a super for honey production until it had been stripped out and cleaned. Another option that I've used is a full brood frame of drone foundation set into the brood box for the workers to draw out and then the queen to lay in. This works well if the bees are on a flow as they draw it out really quickly and the queen will lay a large chunk of drone brood in that frame. But again, what I have found is that sometimes they get quite a bit of honey and pollen in that frame too, so that seems a little bit wasteful. Something that I've been looking to do and will commit to sorting for this season is a method that I was drawn to on Randy Oliver's website, Scientific Beekeeping. I'll post a link in the show notes as usual. It's a really good website and I recommend it for any beekeeper, regardless of your experience. In detailing his method, Randy designed a frame with a thin strip of foundation about two inches wide that sat along the top part of the frame and was secured at the bottom by a strip of wood. Beneath this was an open space down to the bottom bars, open and ready for the workers to fill with drone comb. The rest of the method was pretty much the same as I'd been doing anyway, allowing the comb to be capped and then cutting it out. As the season progresses, you can then perform several drone brood cutouts as a varroa control and hopefully keep the numbers nice and low. I really like the idea of this as using chemical treatments regardless of what they are is time consuming, can be costly and ultimately isn't really what I want to do. Anything that helps me move further away from these treatments has to be a good thing, I think. Remember, if you use any kind of drone brood varroa trapping, you have to remove the comb when it's capped, otherwise you'll just produce lots and lots of varroa. Anyway, 
this season I'm going to make up a couple of these frames for each of my hives and regularly remove drone brood as part of my integrated pest management system. I'll post some pictures of the frame once they're made up and ready to use and then also post pictures and videos of the process as we go through the season. Make sure you sign up to my Patreon page if you haven't already so you don't miss any of my videos. As I mentioned before, there's lots of different methods of mechanical integrated pest management controls that you can use. And if you use something different, then please do let me know. I'm always keen to try out new methods to help my bees. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for hanging around until the end of the podcast. I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Sweet.